Get ready to match the stars. No, it's just another plate meeting podcast with Jeff Gosney and Brian Brower. We'd like to thank them for joining us. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, the OSIP Foundation. They are a proud partner with the plate meeting. We can't thank them enough. It's where OSIP stands for Outstanding Sportsmanship is Paramount. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization in this era of, you know, just tough times for everybody. They can support people that have suffered from officials' abuse, anxiety, or other similar issues. To learn more about OSIP, get involved or donate, visit them at osipfoundation.org. As you know, your donation may be tax deductible. Once again, that's osipfoundation.org. It's T-Mac, it's Gil, it's Brian, it's Jeff. And uh, without uh, further ado, let's take a look at this play in this Plate Meeting Teachable podcast. And uh, let's see what Gil has in store. This is the World Series Runner's Lane Interference play. And uh, Brian, is this yours? Yeah. So uh, Sam Holbrook on the plate here. Uh, obviously didn't make too many friends, but um, I, think, I think at this point, the entire umpiring community is on board with this being a correct call. I hope there's no stragglers left behind. Um, and we can really briefly talk about the rule here, um, which of course is dealing with runner's lane. And our expectation is that the runner on the last 45 feet of his progression to first base is going to run within the bounds of the runner's lane. Um, and that's with both uh, uh, one foot on the ground completely inside the runner's lane. Uh, we do, if he does that legally, we do give him the opportunity to exit the runner's lane on his last step or stride to hit first base, which of course we know is in fair territory. So uh, in a nutshell, that's the rule. And as we can see, Mr. Turner is progressing to first base in fair territory the entire way. And so once he interferes with the first baseman's opportunity to field this throw, we have a violation of the runner's lane rule. Um, and I think maybe one of the things that people get hung up on is it doesn't have to be a good throw. It just has to be a fieldable throw. If the first baseman could have made a play on the ball, were it not for the illegal position of the runner, we should enforce this as a runner's lane violation, which of course we correctly do. Um, so if we can roll this kind of from the beginning and take a peek at the plate umpire's head and eyes as this ball is being fielded, I, to me, that's the key part of this play. Um, and what we're going to see is uh, right about as the fielder fields the ball and is getting set to release it. So here, just back it up a second, right here, sorry we're going to see the plate umpire's eyes go over to um, the batter runner. And why is this important? Um, if we follow the ball, which is what many, many umpires do, we follow the ball in this situation, the ball is going to arrive at first base at the same time as our eyes. And now we have to kind of um, guess about what the progression of the, runner, the batter runner was to first base. Versus what we see our plate umpire do in this case is get his eyes to the batter runner early so that for the entire progression to first base, or at least the important part of it, he's seeing where that batter runner is positioned. And when we do that, we can say with pretty easy certainty that this is a violation of the runner's lane rule and he's going to be called out. So um, not just a good interpretation of the rule, but good mechanics here and something that, you know, it's easy to overlook um, when our eyes get to the, to the runner in this scenario. Can I bring up one thing here, guys? I want everybody to notice that Sammy's essentially hands on these set here. Um, I see a lot of guys on this play wander up the first baseline with their eyes moving all over the place with a nonsense of perspective, perspective because why? They want to get up to the 45 to show that they're moving. But can you speak to the fact, Brian, that he's a step from home plate, but he's going to have just as good of an angle as he would if he was 15 feet ahead of where he is? Yeah, you said it. I mean, in, in this case, um, distance doesn't really help us, right? It's, it's all about the angle and being set. And because the ball was down the third baseline here too, um, so there is the slight chance of it becoming a fair foul issue if the, if the fielder would have let the ball go. Um, he's probably holding his ground at the plate for that. I think there's also runners on base, or maybe not. Um, yeah, there are. So that might have that's going to hold him in the plate area as well, because we don't want to vacate that area um, should the ball get away, and we need to be there for a play of the plate. But yeah, uh, I think a good rule of thumb um, 
when it comes – so let's just imagine there were no runners on base here and, you know, maybe we would see an umpire running all the way up to the 45. A good rule of thumb is don't have the ball originate from behind you whenever possible. Um, now, obviously, if it's an uncaught third strike and the ball's behind us at the backstop, we can't do anything about that. But in this case, keeping the ball in front of us so we know when it's going to be released and we have a perspective on the whole play is, I think, our best practice. But again, getting back to when he gets his eyes to the, to the runner, um, I think that's kind of the beginning, middle, and end of success in umpiring this play. So, uh, Jeff, I'll throw this out to you. Uh, in this situation, the first base umpire and a ball to the infield that's in front of the pitcher's mound, we might try to get a few more steps off the line than, say, a, a ground ball that was routinely to, a, to an infielder. Can you talk a little bit, Jeff, about the thought process behind getting a little bit further off and what that may lead you to see should the throw not be a good one? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I think we've kind of started uh, backing off of the whole uh, getting almost perpendicular to the line. Um, but you see here, uh, who's, I think it's Wolfie, um, gets a pretty good angle here. Um, still has a good uh, good perception of the, of the foot on the base, like we talked about on the previous play. But uh, you could actually, uh, as, the, as the first base umpire, you can actually have a uh, a perception here uh, with a first baseman moving forward of if there actually is a, a hindrance and you might need to get together and talk about this with your plate umpire. Um, I don't, I've been on the field for it before in AAA where, you know, I was the first base umpire and my plate umpire came to me and said, Hey, he was illegal. Did that ball hit him, hit the runner? And I, you know, brought that information to the table and said, yeah, that, that ball hit him uh, in the shoulder. I don't know how you missed it, but it was just, you know, the process of getting the play right. Cause remember, this is not a reviewable play. So if there's a – if the first base umpire has some information here um, that could help out on this call, um, being in a, in a, in a good uh, position off the line, um, you can see uh, it potentially help out, especially with that first baseman moving forward towards a home plate. And also, if that throw takes that first baseman even just a little bit more towards the uh, – towards home plate, he's going to try to reposition his foot – and we might, uh, if we're only a step or two off the line, we might miss that because we're looking through the base. So uh, that, that's probably, you know, just my mechanical, mechanical thoughts on this. On, on a prior episode, guys, we talked about uh, sometimes umpires don't want to make that, that call that stands out, whether it's an obstruction, whether it's the, it was a coach's assist, I believe we were talking about, whether it's interference. Why do so many, I, I, I've had to call this from the field a couple of times where the guy was so illegal and I knew the game was on video that I didn't want to get ourselves in a jackpot. Right. I always say, you know, coach, I'm going to guarantee on the video, it's, you know, the guy's way inside. I don't know what to tell you. You're right. We would have liked to have it done that way, but why are guys adverse to making this call uh, a lot of times? I think, um, I think it's a phrase that gets us in trouble. And that is people like to say the best umpires are, the ones that nobody notices. That's a pretty common term that a, that a younger umpire would hear when they're getting into umpiring. Um, and there's truth to that, right? Like if the game is clean and you start inserting yourself into it, that's not a good thing, right? Because now you're, no, you're being noticed for the wrong reasons. Um, but if there's a play that needs to be officiated, we've, we've got to grab the spotlight and that, go, that runs counter to that advice. And so if some people like to shy away from grabbing the spotlight because they're afraid that, uh, you know, somebody's going to have a bad opinion of them inserting themselves into the game. But the reality is that's the job. So you got to put that behind us. I've seen Brian make this call and be right. It, 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 uh, it, look, there's nothing worse than in your heart knowing that, you missed a call and not calling it for because you just couldn't. It's instinctual. It just happens to know. But I know Brian wasn't thinking this is where I think I'm talking about a play. At, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember it. Um, and just it sold it, sold it, sold it. And I remember because I was working third, the third base coach came to me and he said, that's the third time he's been called for runner's lane interference this season. And I said, I said, you know, I said, you, you might want to get him to run inside the, the 45 he's like no no he does we have it on video I said well you know okay you know but again Brian I'm sure you watched that how far inside of that line was he on that play 
Yeah. Hopefully I pretty far. <laughs> or but, hopefully at least a step. But it, it's like, you have to be willing to make the call. In my opinion, it's just what separates away from the chat. I have to willing to make that call. Gil, before I bore everybody to tears, next play. Oh, I caught Gil off guard. Sorry about that, buddy. So this is a, a – what was this, a ground ball to the third baseman, Gil? Sometimes I wonder what I – what I was looking at when I sent these through. I'm going to learn how to unmute myself eventually. Yes, it is. Okay. That's Brandon Nimmo, I believe. I'm We're going to get a replay in a, We're going to get a replay here in a second uh, from the Diamondbacks. I remember now. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about on this were tag plays. And I thought this was a good example, though this is a play that comes from the infield of how the tag play dynamic has changed over the years. This is a play that in the old school approach would be right. We'd go back to the plate. The catch would have the ball. The runner would just give himself up or have a collision and our play would be over. But now every play is a swipe play. Every play, there are no longer these guys that just give themselves up or collisions where we either has the ball or he doesn't. Every play is now, we've turned it into a close swipe tag. So I want to talk about this particular play because I thought it was intriguing. Now, he gets legal, right? And I forget who was going to take the, uh, take the mantle for this play. But what can we do on a ground ball to the infield in order now that players are catching the ball in front of the plate to help our positioning in order to see that swipe tag that's going to come maybe on the leg or the hip? Where, as a plate umpire, can we go – and is it possible to get there consistently based on how quick this play happens? Yeah, I think it's I think it's 100% possible to to get in a in a in a good position to see this. We want to be moving, uh, you know, get more third baseline extended. We'll talk about the you know the wedge keyhole, the train track. Uh, I like to refer to it. You know, have the runner sliding at you, um, and and just not to to tangent too much here, but this is a direct. Uh, uh, descendant of, of replay replay is what has caused this um because like you said t-mac you know this used to be either the runner's going to give himself up or the catcher's going to be more in the pathway runner's pathway and we're going to have a collision um so this has definitely evolved pretty quickly now that runners know you know either we're going to work to get the call right or replay is going to show that they swam over the tag or contorted their body or something so yeah i think uh dougie does a good job here moving to his right and the thing is you don't want to move too quick. And this play develops so quickly. Um, and the, 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 the thing I would be looking at initially and uh, why I preface you don't want to move too quick, if that catcher – so the ball is coming from a drawn-in infielder, so the catcher does not have to give the runner a pathway per the rule, per the collision rule. Um, so if this catcher were to stay in the pathway, I'm probably going to stay more at the point of the plate. But since that didn't happen, since uh, um, the catcher – Avila, I believe, uh, moved out into fair territory. I know now this is going to be 100% swipe tag. There's going to be no block of the play because Avila is not going to try to move in there and take the collision or take a hit from the runner. So as soon as I see that catcher move out into fair territory, I'm busting to the right to get third baseline extended, um, inside hit of the catcher, runner coming at me, whatever it is you key off of, just get yourself over there because you want to be having that look that Brian talked about on a previous episode of that uh, seeing the glove and the body. Um, you never want to put anything between the glove and the body of the runner. So Dougie does a good job moving over to his right. The only, you know, the, the Monday morning umpires here at the water cooler are going to say, well, he should have been more to his right. Well, yeah, the runner didn't do him any favors by the way he kind of tries to reach around. But I think the way you combat that is to be closer to the play and you're almost looking down over it. Um, you know, almost like a, a Joe West or a Rob Drake style where you're basically looking down. And, and I love, not to tangent again, but I love getting videos, plays of the play from stadiums that are a dome because they've always got that camera looking right down on the plate. You can see all 360 degrees and see how the umpire moves around to get in position or what the ideal position would be. Um, so I think, uh, I think Doug does a great job here moving to his right. This is exactly what I would do. Um, you're a little bit closer to the play because that tag is actually with the way Avila is going to be coming back is actually 
up a little bit from that front edge of the plate. So you want to kind of, you know, the runner might nick you. It's not full on Joe West style from last year where, you know, we're kind of the same, don't move. Well, I get helped up, but, you know, there, there might be some contact. And, you know, would you rather have the runner brushing off you a little bit but getting the play right and being on top of it? Or would you rather be back protecting yourself and saying, don't get involved with the play and just missing the play? I'm a firm believer, and this is just my school of thought, my comfort zone for taking plays, be on top of the play like Doug here. Ryan? I have literally nothing to add. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, let me ask you a question. So yeah. when this play happens initially, there's a ground ball to the third baseman, second and third one out playing, and you know that that play's coming. At this stage, do you think to yourself – okay, where's my tag going to be in all likelihood and try to play your percentages in that way? When does the point of you going, okay, my catcher is now for some reason three feet in front of home plate. This is probably going to be a kneecap back leg tag where he's going to be reaching for the plate and I'm going to have a mess here. Uh, the only, I'd say there's probably only two times that I, I might key off something else and that would, uh, I'm not so sure that they would develop from a ball uh, a, a quick return throw like this from the infield. Um, the catcher moving up the line, uh, you know, basically vacating home plate where the play is no longer at the plate. I'm going to go with him and, you know, I might end up in fair territory um, to make that call. Or if the catcher um, vacates the plate towards third and will be diving back. I think a, a great play that uh, everybody likes to beat up on Fonzie for is the one from Houston, uh, I believe last year, where it was just a broken play. But all we want to focus on is the fact that he wasn't in the wedge to see that play, but he couldn't get there um, because of the way the catcher was diving back. Um, those are probably about the only two, um, or the catcher coming from foul territory. Those three would be the only big things I key off of. Otherwise, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to get too smart because I'm honestly not that smart to begin with. So I'm not trying to overthink the play. I'm just going to go, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to completely give up on the ball. I know, I everlasting on the ball except for a select, you know, 1% of the time. We've touched on it in the previous two episodes, you know, a, a, a force play at first. Um, and then there, I believe the runner's lane was another one where we're taking our eyes off the ball. A tag play like this, I'm not tracking that ball all the way to the glove. I'm going to obviously know that the throw is coming at me, but I'm going to pick up the fielder's glove and let that glove take me to that tag. Because without that ball, there's no play. So – find the fielder's glove and let that take you instead of staying with the ball all the way to the glove and then the glove all the way to the ground. You just, you don't have time to refocus because this play, the, the play is so quick. Um, so that's the, that, that's probably what I'm looking at. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm not thinking it's, it's, uh, it, we all get to that point in our, um, our umpiring where, I don't want to say if it's confidence or just uh, we've seen so many plays where instincts just take over. And I, I think uh, uh, Larry Young hit the nail on the head. Uh, one of the big league supervisors, when he said one time, uh, he asked an umpire, you know, what took you, uh, what took you to that spot for that play? And the umpire said, honestly, I don't know. He was in the, in the proper position, but he didn't know how he got there. And Larry had the perfect response. He said, that's perfect. I wanted, I wanted you to tell me that because that tells me that you're using your instincts instead of trying to think through the play. So, as you develop and get more comfortable taking plays and, and you've seen a lot of plays and how they develop, you get to the point where instincts take over it and you really don't know how you got to, to that spot, but you know, from a younger age, uh, younger stage building up to it, what the keys are. So I can go back and look at movements that I have taking place. I can tell you, well, I was probably keying off this, but I can't consciously tell you right after the play. Well, yeah, I saw the ball was coming in from a, a 45 degree angle with 52% humidity and the, the fielder was, outstretched this way you know his, his arm is, is five feet from his body type thing no it just I've just learned to to just you know instinctually go off different keys it, it, I could just listen to this all day I mean and let me just say this um again you know we're, we're doing this with with the great Jeff guys and the great Brian DeBrower uh Brian is the lead instructor or uh, the lead tr training or something at United. Like just to say, if you go to a camp, he's going to be there and well worth the price of admission. Same goes for Jeff Gosney. If you go into uh, a UCU camp and why are their names? So UTD. Uh, a UTD camp, a UTD camp. Why are they, why can't I figure that stuff out? Well, I, I don't know because I, I apologize. What's the UTD, but I think by this, by this point, 
all of you guys uh, know who these two are, and uh, that's a good thing. And hopefully uh, we can take one last play here, or potentially, and this is a goofy play, but it's just one of those weird plays that anything can happen. This is first and second. This is the end of the game. It looks like it's going to be a foul ball, and then it's not. I saved this one for you, Brian, because I thought it was uh, – thought it was hilarious that you have to officiate seven things on the same play. Yeah, very nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the kind of play that I'm sure happened at your travel ball weekend this weekend that you spoke of earlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, it gets kind of wacky out there when the 14 and unders are playing. Um, no, but this, I mean, this is a, I don't know if you can have a better example of someone that's just totally in command of officiating a particular event in a game, right? So we have the fair foul decision, um, the possible interference uh, and or obstruction, and then a tag and a proper use of eyes on the release of the ball. And then go ahead and transition right from that into dealing with the runner's lane violation that's gonna happen as he's moving, or the possible runner's lane violation that's gonna happen as he's moving down the first baseline. And there's probably some more stuff in there that I'm not even mentioning. Um, and, you know, this is, this is one of those things where if you're a younger umpire, you're not going to do this that well, right? And expecting yourself to do it that well is just setting yourself up, up for failure. Um, or, and I should say less experienced umpire, not younger umpire. Uh, but as we progress, like Jeff was kind of talking about in the last segment, um, the more things you see, the more comfortable you're going to be the next time. I think a, a phrase that we sometimes use at our clinics is, smooth seas never made a good captain. And so if you're just hoping for, for easy, calm baseball games and for nothing to happen, I mean, that might be great for your blood pressure, but in terms of learning how to officiate the game, you want some wacky stuff to happen um, and you want to then learn from it. That's the, that's the real key is to, to take stock of, of what happened on the field, um, analyze your performance, talk to, to people that you trust about it. Hopefully you have a partner on the field and then the next time it happens, you'll do it better. I guarantee this isn't the first time. Uh, who is this? Uh, James Rackley. Is that the play? Dave, Dave, Dave Rackley. Yeah. Dave Rackley. Um, I, you know, I guarantee if you rewind 15 years in his career, he had some wacky play at the plate and he probably did something wrong. And it's, it's putting all those pieces together or, over the course of a game and a season and multiple seasons that get you to the place where you can officiate this play the way that, uh, that Dave Rackley is doing here. And I wanted to bring this up because I, I, to me, this is just great officiating and it's great officiating because what do they say? An average umpire can dif uh, differentiate one thing that goes on. A good umpire can do two and then you get into great and three. And then if you can do in this case, differentiating so many different things in the same play and getting them all right and not going crazy and killing the play for interference or letting the play develop, uh, Jeff, I'm sure you've had a play like this uh, in your time or two in the minor leagues and the big leagues. I mean, your thoughts when you this the play goes haywire in a particular play? Uh, my thoughts are I uh, should have taken a dive in the seventh. No, um, <laughs> it's just it's. It, I think uh, I, I think, and you can kind of see it with Dave here. You go back to the baseball. Find once the, once he misses that tag, there some goofy stuff happened initially, but not too far off the spectrum. When Luke Roy goes for the tag and misses it, and you can see the Dave uh, racks processing that. But then he just you see you see him staring at that ball on the ground uh, after I don't know if it came off his chest protector or not. Um, but I almost when I'm looking at that, I almost see him kind of like resetting, like okay, we're not done yet, and. And you can see him regroup, you know, he signals nothing, no tag, no interference, no uh, what's the tangle and tangle, any of that stuff leading up to that. And then, uh, you know, like right here, he's looking at that ball. And I, I would hazard to say that his instincts are telling him right now, you know, kind of reset, you know, focus, stay, stay with his play. Um, and I'm sure if you asked him, he he's probably doesn't have much, you know, after the fact, he's probably not going to tell you well, hey, yeah, I was looking at this and thinking about this and this and that. You know, it's just instinctual, and as it should be for someone at his, uh, at his level. But uh, I would just be trying to slow everything down as much as I could, um, not getting too quick with, uh, with any of these different aspects or, or, or rules. 
um, potential rule interpretations here. Um, so yeah, just trying to be as slow as possible. Like even that right there, just the initial fair foul, that's, uh, there's so much going on there because the batter, the catcher's in front of the batter. It's right on the line. The ball actually comes back from foul territory, I believe. It's, it spins back. So, I mean, even that, just staying focused on that is, it, it, for an average umpire, is an accomplishment in and of itself. And, and everything else that goes with it here is just, you know, it, uh, it, it just shows how focused and how in tune you have to be to work at this level. So we're going to have a bonus play coming up here because uh, uh, we have a couple of minutes and I wanted to show one more play. Um, and uh, of course that also requires me learning how to sh share my screen. Uh, this is going to be, this is going to be Tim's screen sharing debut, if you will. Uh, actually on the, if you oh, want to call, call sports, the, the, the Rackley play, we called it uh, six calls in six seconds. It's called uh, Rackley's rapid response. So you can search for that. So is my screen sharing? No. No. Is that a green uh, button that says share screen? I'm trying to hit Google Chrome. I've got so much downloading here from the other thing. <laughs> so it's not going to let me because uh, my wife has saved me from myself. Um, well, anyway, I guess we're not going to look at this play. Um, yeah, is it a permission? No, it's no. not. It's, you, 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 this, this, unlike the, unlike the, the, one of the earlier recordings that we did, this one is not my fault. Yeah. Well, I, it's not letting me share. It says you do not have permission to share your screen. So I, I somebody is doing that, but I, I want to talk for a second before we wrap things up with Brian DeBrower. I have it written down right here. This is the, 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 the note thing, Brian DeBrower, UCU, Je uh, Jeff, UTD. And for some reason there's something you know, you guys know. There's Tim, is that, mu is, is that a music sheet? This is my trusty rundown sheet here. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about uh, officiating second base for a second in either three-man or four-man. Uh, I, know, I know, Brian, you're very progressive in, in this, and we, we, we're trying to figure things out. I've, I've seen you umpire from behind second base in three-man, which is something that I, I've done, and uh, I'm surprised they still let me officiate. Uh, in the indie ball ranks for, for doing stuff like that. Just trying to see, just trying to feel, and we're talking going back to 2013 doing this, you know, before this was going on. So trying to see where is the best place to be able to get a stolen base. And the great thing about independent baseball is if you have a good supervisor, you can pretty much learn the game and do things that you want and figure out how to umpire and get better at it. So, um, You've umpired both, both styles. I've seen the umpire from behind second base on stolen bases and take those plays. Can we talk about that for just a second? Because where is this going? Uh, where are we going to be standing uh, in 10 years from the future? Uh, I think if you have a major league logo on your shirt, you'll probably be outside second base. If you have any other type of logo on your shirt, you'll probably be inside second base. I think that's the simplest way to put it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. For those for those umpires that are working at the major league level, um, it's more comfortable for them. They get more reps behind second base. Uh, they get more opportunities to uh, to practice back there than a than a typical amateur umpire that's not working as many three or four man games in a year. Um, and the game is typically cleaner too, right? So the plays are a little bit more predictable, uh, at least more often than not. Um, and there's a lot of problems with being behind second base for literally everything other than the steal play, right? So double plays, base hits, trouble balls in the outfield, everything else starts to get a lot harder when you're back out behind second base. And so I think for um, your, your typical amateur umpire that doesn't get a ton of opportunities to go back there, the safer route is to stay inside and take care of all the other things that we know we need to umpire on that, on a R1 only situation, right? The ground ball double play line drives to the infield, uh, trouble balls in the outfield, all that stuff. Um, and then we sacrifice the perfect look at the steal because we know the perfect look at the steal would be somewhere behind second base with the runner sliding towards us staying on the hip of the fielder to make sure that we put ourselves in the window slash wedge slash keyhole slash on the right track. 
<laughs> Jeff, uh, as we close and wrap things up here on uh, the third edition of our Teachable Plate Meeting podcast, uh, your thoughts on, on, on steals at second and, and the new wave approach of, uh, of umpiring second base? Uh, I, I think real quick, you know, we talked about the, the pickoff at first and how umpires are, are starting more off the line because they want to see the runner, have the runner coming back at them. And that's, I, from the guys I've talked to at the big league level, that's the, the consensus, consensus is they feel they're getting a better look when the runner's sliding at, uh, toward them. And, you know, from my time working second base, I've never actually taken a steal out there. But if you think about, you know, a, a throw, a base hit and a throw home, and then the catcher goes to second with it, the way we're working around the base is we're trying to get that runner sliding at us. So it's basically the same concept. We're just, uh, you know, taking more steps to get there on a base, on, on a ball that's put in play. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, you, you really, you got to work, you got to be a little bit more in tune just from what I've noticed and, and stuff when I'm, you know, kind of observing and, and breaking down what these guys are doing. You'll see with, with force plays and initial setups that uh, there's no really one set standard. Some guys prefer, you know, left side, right side. The way they're taking that force play at second base varies. Um, I, I think Phil Cuzzy is actually one of the best that I've seen uh, work outside of second base. He, he moves around there and he, he puts himself in very good position um, to, to see all the plays. Uh, but there's just, you got you to gotta be on your toes a lot uh, to be able to be out there. And uh, I mean, I hope that someday we get there, but I don't see it uh, being there in the near future for anybody below uh, the big league level. Well, we've recorded a few of these and hopefully uh, you guys uh, out there in the viewing audience like them. If you do, we'll do them again. We'll do some more of them. And if you don't, you'll never hear from me again doing any of these. Uh, our special thanks to our guest, Brian DeBrower, Jeff Gosdy, Brian, the the Mac and United umpire clinic coordinator and an umpire in the SEC and the Colonial, as well as being a former minor league instructor. Jeff Gosney, UTD training director and umpire in the ACC and the SEC, and of course the former MLB umpire and a umpire, uh, the umpire school instructor as well. Nice resumes, fellas. Thanks so much. We cannot do this without you. You guys are awesome. Thank you for having us. Until next time, happy umpiring, everyone.